thankful I can say that I know him and I'm thankful I can say that I love him but I like what John said when he said we love him because he first loved us it's a wonderful thing to love the Lord this morning but it's a more amazing thing that he loves us we say from time to time boy I, well, the way the Lord found me and how he loved me and how he saved me and I'm thankful for that but boy, I guarantee you, every day of my life, I'm thankful that he still loves me. Because I'm still not worth a whole lot, amen. But thank God that he still loves me. And I tell you this morning, <clears throat> I don't know if we, everybody needs an energy drink. Or if they drank one too early before they come to church and you've done crash. But we, we need to come alive a little bit knowing that Jesus is alive and well. You say, preacher, I got troubles, I got sorrows, I got heartache. You know what? At least you got somebody that can walk through this life with you. Amen. Amen. This old world, they got heartaches, but they don't have anybody they can depend on. He said, he'd never leave me nor forsake me. He'd be a friend that'd stick closer than a brother. And I tell you what, this morning, we ought to just thank him. We ought to praise him. He's worthy this morning. Sing out again, if you will. Let's honor the Lord.
farms a million times or more. And each time he has held me tenderly. So I can stand and say to you, I know him. Will you stand with me and agree? appreciate that good song. Amen. Boy, what a wonderful day to be in the Lord's house. Well, Brother Dean and Brother Preston slipped in on us this morning, didn't they? Come scootering down through there. Amen. And uh, Brother Dean, come on around and preach to us a little bit, if you will. That'd be good. Let's take our Bible and follow along and support the man of God as he preaches. I believe the Lord has something for us this morning. If we'll be Attentive unto him. Amen. Thank you. All right, everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. 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 Lord, thank you for Calvary. Thank you for Jesus sent from the Father. Thank you for the Holy Ghost sent from the Savior. Thank you that the church was sent by the Holy Ghost. And thank you that the gospel came to us. Lord, thank you for our heritage and our home. Our Father, I pray that you'd breathe on us today. Lord, I pray for Brother Quarles, Brother Jeremiah, God, that you'd touch him. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this month with the camps going on all this month. I pray that you'd hover over this place in power and glory like a thick cloud that does bring water. Oh, Lord, pour out thy power. <clears throat> may, sal may the winds of salvation blow. May the winds of the Holy Ghost, deliverance, revival, and rescue, may those winds blow this month, Lord. God, give the church what they need to give these meetings, these camps, what they need. Lord, thank you for being so kind to us in this country, in this nation. <clears throat> I don't know how to ask forgiveness for our sins in this nation. But our Lord, I ask you to be merciful. Give us an extension where we could have revival in our churches and revival in our children. Lord, if we don't have revival in our children, we'll lose all of them. Our Father, help us in the power of God. Thank you for loving us. Now bless the preaching time this morning. In Jesus' name, and all the Lord's people said, 
Amen. Thank the Lord. Well, go to the book of Jude. <clears throat> the book of Jude. You can just go to the first chapter. It'll be fine. I had church members I pastored that would not have got that. Thank the Lord. Hadn't he been good to us? Bless the Lord. I am so sorry that I was several states away and could not be here just, uh, I guess, a few days ago now. But I'm glad that heaven's waiting on us, aren't you? I believe it's pretty special to us, to our family, Brother Jeremiah, thank you for letting us preach this morning. Uh, 1982, I was right there when the Lord came to me. And I always liked to come back here in July. That was 1982. That was 37 years ago. Some of y'all were old 37 years ago. How are you still here? <laughs> ah, look at them, how old some of them are. 37 years ago, right over here. And I never will forget several things I won't forget. Uh, well, <laughs> several things I'll tell you after church, but lots of things happened that night. And uh, some of these were little guys. I've, I've turned 50 uh, Friday. I'm still receiving gifts throughout the month if anybody's. It, Brandon, you haven't got me nothing yet. Anybody else needs to. I'll be receiving gifts all month. Billy Joe, you hadn't got me nothing. I was 13 on the championship basketball. <laughs> I should know better to pick on Billy Joe. You're going to get a response. <laughs> I was 13. We won the championship that year. And I just remember Billy, Billy Joe and uh, oh, the Gibson brothers. And uh, several of them. There are two stories I can't tell about that. <laughs> but I was 13. Billy Joe was a senior. I thought he was seven foot seven. <laughs> and uh, but I'll never forget that night. We the Lord started the service at nine. We had church from seven to nine. And uh, at nine, the Lord started the service. It didn't slow down until about 2 in the morning. Now, and over there is where the Lord run into me. And then some point in time, about 11 o'clock, I was over here in a pile, a huddle. There were 20 of us praying. I think 37 got saved that night. Seven called to preach. And uh, Brother Jeremiah and Brother John Dorsey, they were like five and six years old, running around, getting spankings, <laughs> starting fights. A lot of stories I can't tell. Not until the love offering's made out and after the check. And I don't think you get a love offering for just dropping by. But there's a chance if I mention it, see. I'm kin, I'm kin to this half, so I'm going to appeal to this half over here. But I was right there, and the, and the Lord, I don't know how to tell this, and you don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it. The Lord was so real, I thought he was right there and put his hand on my shoulder. He was right there. And I looked up to see the Lord. I can't tell you how real it was. And I looked up to see the Lord, and I was there, and I looked up. And of course, I didn't see Jesus. But I looked up, and Brother Gentry was standing right here. I looked right at him. I looked up to see the Lord, and there was God's man. He was just doing this. <laughs> Ding! And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he didn't, he didn't say anything at that point, but he was looking right at me. And so I thanked the Lord what a great heritage. Wouldn't it be something if God blowed revival? And there's no formulas. 
There are no formulas. Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen. I'm not going to be offended if you preach that. I'll even say amen. I'll be kind and say amen. No need to be strifeful. I don't know if that's a word. Is that a word, English teacher? But I'll say amen. But Second Chronicles seven fourteen is what God told a Jewish king to do when Israel got backslid as a nation. And it don't quite fit in the church age. Because we're not looking for a land to be healed. The Lord's not going to revive America as a nation. And he don't need this land. And I know you pray at football games and pray at NASCAR races. I'm pretty sure the Lord don't hear either of those silly prayers in those silly settings. But I guarantee you one thing, if the Lord does send revival, he'll do it to his churches. There's not a formula. Jonah had that first great revival. The first mass group of Gentiles getting saved. Anything that happened outside the Jewish economy, first thing we seen was Jonah. And the world was not that populated then. Uh, Nineveh was the capital of the world empire at the time of Assyria. And Brother Jeremiah, that when God blew in there, nothing made sense. The revival happened. Nobody prayed for it. Nobody thought of it. The preacher that preached the meeting got mad because they got right. <laughs> he was backslid before and after. He may have been from Georgia, I don't know. None of it made sense. That ought to encourage you that we don't have to have all of our ducks in a row for the Lord to breathe in there on us. One old king repented and everybody else repented. They all believed God. And the king said, who can tell if God, who can tell? Well, I got news for you. Nobody can tell. God's going to do what God's going to do. Isn't that wonderful? Thank the Lord for it. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the last baptism Brother Gentry did was Preston and one of the Dorsey girls. I don't know if it's Hannah or Rachel. But the last baptism is one of the Dorseys, I believe. I just remember a Dorsey getting baptized with a McNeese, and I thought this could go really several different ways. But walked up there, and Brother Gentry, and he laid his hands on Preston, and before he baptized him, he started talking. And he talked over 10 minutes, and he talked to the church. And I remember a lot of what he said. He challenged this church to go on and not compromise. He had a talk. But I was just blessed that he had his hands on my boy the whole time. The last time he was in that Jordan in them dividing waters. Well, I'm being sentimental and nostalgic. I turned 50 yesterday. I'm going to deliberately act like an old man from now on. <laughs> Some of you, too, are very old. I've been watching you. Are you in the book of Jude? For just a moment, I, the Lord's preparing my heart to, this morning. I was looking at these scriptures. Be going to teen camp tomorrow with Brother Stroud. And we'll be in camp over there. You pray for us. There are about 500 youngins signed up and a lot of people drive in for the nights. You pray the power of God on us over there. And th this is probably what I'll be preaching tomorrow night. The Lord will, of course, the Lord will pull it out fresh. It'll be different. But it's on my heart this morning, so I'm going to go over it in the book of Jude. Now, thank the Lord for the book of Revelation. Aren't you glad the Lord's coming back? Amen. Revelation chapter 1. Y'all just bear with me, and we'll share our heart for a little while. It's wonderful to see everybody. We love you. Look in chapter, I'm in Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, 
and every eye shall see him. You ought to pop a happy bubble, smack three people that forgot how to tithe, kick two people in the shin that gossip a little too much, and then shout for an hour that the Lord's coming back. <laughs> he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see him. Thank the Lord. I'm glad he's coming. But before he comes, we're going to have to live in these last hours. Before he comes, we're going to have to live in these last hours. Now, 2,000 years, I believe there's scriptures support this, that, that, that we are now entering into the third day, and I believe we're at the end of the church age. Uh, no man knows the day or the hour. They didn't when Jesus was standing here. Uh, probably don't know now. The Lord may know now, but uh, we, we don't know the day or the hour. But uh, we do know the times and the seasons, Paul said in Thessalonians. So look in the book of Jude. It was J. Vernon McGee who said, the book of Jude is a Kodak snapshot, which now none of these kids know what a Kodak (laughs) snapshot is. But it's a Kodak snapshot of world and church conditions right before the Lord comes back. Jude being situated right before Revelation gives us a picture of what's going on right before the Lord comes back. Now, a lot of preaching could be done right there with that thought in mind, but I'm, it's, I'm not interested in that this morning. What I want to show you is how the Lord's give us, He's given us everything we need in this hour to survive this hour. And the book of Jude right here, there is a, there is a trio of, of tried and true truths right here. There are several triads. I'm not even sure what that word means, but that's what they said in my studies yesterday and today. There are several groups of three. Look at these in Jude. Look in verse 1. You got Jude. You got three individuals named Jude, Jesus, and James. That's interesting. Then you have the Trinity in verse 1. You got sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. I know it don't say it, but the Holy Ghost is often the unnamed, the unseen one. And that third thing, you think, Brother Quarles, that, that, that'd be him right there. Sanctified by the Father, preserved in Christ, and called. Ain't it the Holy Ghost that came calling? Amen. The Holy Ghost. All right. Now, there's three characters. I don't have none of this alliterated or rhyming. Uh, there, there are three in the Trinity, the Godhead. And then look at these three uh, promises or these three positions. I don't know what. We're sanctified, we're preserved, and we're called. Bless the Lord. And then you get in that next verse, too. And here's three graces that are afforded us. Look in, look in verse 2. Mercy and peace and love multiplied. Well, I'm about to have a, a little shouting spell. Just a little one, not a bit, but a little one. About to have a spell. Thank God, I think he's given us all we need to survive what's in this hour. Now, I don't want to go over all this other stuff. It's some bad stuff. Look in verse 4. You got certain men crept in unawares, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. In verse 5, you got apostates. You got the Israelites that were brought out of Egypt, but Egypt never got out of them. And they were destroyed that believed not. Verse 5. Verse 6, now we tiptoe over into some heavy duty stuff. The angels which kept not their first estate. Now there's two or three possibilities of who them angels could be the ones that fell from heaven. Could be the angels that I believe sinned in Genesis 6 with women. And there's several options, but whatever it is, I'm going to point you to the fact that me and you are dealing with some heavy duty dark devils, fallen angels. We're dealing with them in this hour. Now look in verse 7. There's the Sodomites. Sodom and Gomorrah. Brother Jeremiah, I know we could run a tangent here and preach for three hours on what all's wrong with America. And, and there's so much turning our stomach, it's unbelievable. But one of the most recent things that's just unbelievable is these transgender men 
uh, having book readings in public libraries. Has anybody seen that? Especially in Gay Pride Month that just got done. Uh, when I was a little boy, Mama carried us to the library in, in Missouri, and then when Dad pastored in Tennessee, Mama would take us to the library once a month during the summertime, and you'd sit there with 40 other kids, and they'd read a book. We did that. That's a tradition in America. Brother, they've got... <laughs> children, don't look it up, but parent, you need to go Google that. They have got transgender men, drag queens performing songs and stories for children in the libraries. It is unbelievable what's going on this past month in the gay pride marches. And brethren, I got news for you. There's a spirit of reprobation. There are strong devils that are unfurled across this nation. And brethren, you're living in an hour. You better pull your head out of the sand and, and better get full of the Holy Ghost. We better quit fussing about how much a light bulb cost and who sang my song and who parked in my spot and why I didn't like the brown carpet, I wanted green carpet. You better get over all that stuff, bunch of Baptists. You better get over it because the devil's coming in strong. Teenagers, you better quit flirting with sin. Young couples... You better, you better get away from carnality and other carnal young couples. You better get full of the Holy Ghost and go with some Christians. You're not going to survive if you don't. It's a strong hour, strong hour. Uh, we need our parents to be full of the Holy Ghost. Quit chasing the American dream and start chasing the heavenly vision. I'm going to say something else you don't hear much. We need some grandparents to get over whatever is bothering you and to come help us pray for revival. We need some grandparents. I believe our, one of our biggest failings is, is the older people in our generation are not on fire for God. And therefore, all the, all the parents in their 30s and 40s are not challenged to live, and it's so easy to compromise. And then the youngins ain't got a clue there's so much devils around them. Brethren, there's some strong serpents coming after us. Look in verse 8. Here you got all the dope heads. Here you got everyone's own dope. And I'm not being ugly. Brother Quarles, I don't have an ugly or a nasty spirit about this. I think a lot of people need a lot of help with our chemical addictions. So I'm not being ugly about it. But it's a fact. These filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignity. Filthy dreamers. That's people that are in a stupor and in a glaze during the day. That's our entire nation. We're hooked on marijuana. We're hooked on, uh, I've seen the latest thing in the inner cities is PSP. I hate to even talk about this stuff. You can dip cigarettes down into that liquid and it, that, that's what's causing the people to run naked through the middle of the street. It's absolutely out of their mind. The bath crystals and the, and the crystal meth and, and then right here even in our own ranks, our own family doctors are giving us things that are, that are narcotic. It's not medicine. I don't want to talk about it long, but half the people probably in here, and I'm not being ugly to you. I'm just telling you, our generation is eat up with things that makes us victims instead of victors, that make us dream in the day. And, and I understand that there's three or four percent of people who actually have physical, chemical needs. But over 95% of us are on stuff that steal our joy and steal our strength and steal our awareness and steal our presence. God meant for us to have highs and lows. Deuteronomy 11, I'm bringing you into a land that's got hills and it's valleys. Guess what you're going to find up on a hill? That is glorious up there. Guess what you're going to find in a low place? He'll be faithful. He'll be faithful. He'll be faithful. He'll be faithful. Everybody's afraid to hit the bottom. The bottom is where usually you meet God. Don't worry about it. If you fall apart, He'll hold you together. He can put it back together. I'm telling you, I'm not being ugly to my generation. We are a generation of daydreamers. And it turns filthy because it's open portals for devils. That's why I use the word filthy. And it turns into things. That's not the Holy Ghost filling your mind. It's, it's other spirits filling your mind. I hope I didn't hurt anybody right there. Look in verse 9. There's Michael the archangel contending with the devil. Disputing about the body of what? 
Ryan, Dakota, you front row young men, did it say disputing about the body of Christ? What did it say? The body of Moses. That's interesting. In the book of Jude, the spiritual warfare is going over to Israel. The devil's contending with Michael over the body of Moses in this hour. Not so much the body of Christ. Woo! Honey, you ought to put on your rapture shoes. We're fixing to get out of here. Y'all are just looking at me. I'll throw something at somebody. I'm kin to that side. I got to come over here. I can't throw. I'll throw something at y'all. Look at here. 1600 to 1900 was the latter day reign, spiritually speaking, for the Gentiles. The millennial reign yet to come, that's for the Jews. That'll be their latter day reign. You and I are in a little hour where he's dealing with the nations. Every time Brother Gentry would preach that I heard him in the last several years, he talked about the nations. I only got to drop in y'all about once a year, once every two years. But he was talking about them rattling chains of the Euphrates and the Tigers last time I was here. God's dealing with the nations right now. He's drawing the Jews back and he's got the... There's 188 188 of them meet in New York City. It's the United Nations. Who do you think let them get united? I'm about to run. Honey, in the... the, Dr. B.B. Caldwell said, the most dangerous time to be alive is in the transition of dispensations because most individuals fall through the cracks and go to hell. Somebody gets saved in this hour, they need to thank God for double mercy. He is not dealing with individuals primarily in this hour so much as he is dealing with nations. That drawing powers going back to the Jews, the 1900 had been about the nations. And the great warfare in the hour, you say, well, what about all this devil stuff you're talking about in America? That's because we've been turned over. As a nation, we've been turned over to a reprobate mind. Why do you think people are flooding, uh, that's not the right word, funneling away from our old-fashioned churches and going to these mega churches? It's because there's no dress standard. There's no Bible version standard. There's no doctrinal ecumenical standard. There's no personal standard. There's no leadership standard. There is no standard in them mega churches. And the average believer in America has already crossed the line, which was the standard. I'm going to tell you something. This is our old home church. It's our old home church. I respect the new pastor with everything I got. And pray for you. I pray for you. Every day I pray for you. And I got news for you. We better, we better do something and pray. That, that this church doesn't go the way of 99% of the churches. And if some individual Christians don't get some backbone about what you believe in your heart, in your heart, then you'll be right on that yonder. Brother Jeremiah, you know I'm not being ugly. I'm not an ugly type preacher. Half, most of the young people and half the adults, if we knew what kind of music, when they pulled off, what kind of music's playing. And, when, and, and any time that you pump in, you're pumping in demons. You're pumping in demons. Everybody wants to complain about, complain about depression and everybody listen to country music. Duh. Help me now. I was going through Walmart the other day and George Jones was burying her again. Son, I just stopped and put my hand over my heart and went and bought a black wreath and <laughs> cried for a month. I didn't even know her and I stopped loving her that day too. I guarantee you. Didn't even know her and I was all tore up there. Well, I spent a whole year tore up with her. I <laughs> didn't know her, but boy, she put the black wreath back in the market. I got news for you. We claim to be an old-fashioned church and there's so much contemporary music and country music and rock music right here in our own assembly. I'm not picking on you. I'd say that in any church I was in. Our best churches, independent, fundamental, supposed to be, used to be separated. And our own churches. 
and what you're feeding your soul. You say, I'm just an individual. Does it really play out to the whole corporate? Yes, it does. It plays out into the whole congregation. And then from the whole congregation into the community. Why do you think America collapsed so quickly in such depravity? Because there's no church there holding it hardly. I'm sorry that I'm in the book of Jude, but we're talking about it. These filthy dreamers, this, this warfare going on right now with Israel. And then look in verse 11. He brings up three. Here's another set of three. Woe unto them. And if the Lord had helped me tomorrow night, in front of all them young people and, and several churches, Brother Jeremiah, I'm going to preach on these three. I'm going to ask them, where's everybody gone? Where's everybody gone in this hour? Well, it tells you, woe unto them. That word woe is a big word. That's eternal damnation. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Cain went his own way when it came to religion. Balaam went his own way. He was a prophet. He was a true prophet. But he took a bribe. And he went his own way for reward. And a true prophet did not become a false prophet but a true prophet became a bad prophet. And then there's Korah with his rebellion against the delegated authority against Moses. Cain's gone the way of religion. Balaam's gone the way of reward. And Korah's gone the way of rebellion. Did I say Cain gone the way of religion? There's the three. Now come down in verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you. Anybody, can anybody sense this in the church? They're feeding themselves without fear. They're clouds, they are without water. Carried about of winds. I got a little sermon I hadn't preached nowhere yet, Brother Jeremiah. Winds, friends, trends, and bends. It's eating us up alive. We got a generation that... <laughs> Me and Brother Wilson was fellowshipping on right before the service on how there is no variableness nor shadow of turning with our God. The word variableness. There's no change. There's no turn. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And yet we got some who are empty clouds. And every wind, you're gone. And every trend, you run. And every new friend, you follow. And there's so many bends. And what ought to be straight? Oh, we're looking at it. We're looking at it. Brother Jeremiah, verse 13, gets real interesting. You got demon possession. You got these raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Every time you see foaming, that's a sign of demon possession. The sea is the nations raging. Is this not an hour where people are raging, foaming, their own shame, and wandering stars? Now you're getting into some heavy duty things. This demonic world. And there comes Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Look at here, all of a sudden. All of a sudden in verse 14, I'm about to shout. All of a sudden in verse 14, the second coming pops up. Hey, y'all, aren't you glad the Lord's coming? Enoch, the seventh from Adam. He was the one that was raptured. Woo! What's he doing here in the book of Jude? Somebody better help me. I was going to let y'all out at 1230, but if you, know, if you don't help me, I get to feeling lonely. I'll just hang around for personal therapy. All that extra preaching we preachers do, that's for our own personal therapy. What about verse 14? Enoch shows up. He's the raptured feller. Woo! He was not. What do y'all do? What do y'all think about? Glory! Aren't you glad in the middle of all that we were getting into it pretty dark, pretty depraved? Boom! 14. Enoch. Seventh. He shows up in verse 14, Brother Dorsey. Which is half that side, so I'll come over here, Brother Dorsey. Shows up in 14. 
Ooh, that ought to excite you. I think we talked about this a couple of years ago, Brother Jeremiah, I can't remember. I did me a good study on the number 14. Whew. Got interested in 14. There are 14 tribes, 14 apostles, 14 epistles for the church. Mm. Manasseh and Ephraim got brought in under the cross and the covenant. And the Bible recognized them as two other tribes. Judas went out and hanged himself. They elected Matthias. And then Paul got called, 13 and 14. What do y'all think about that? Mm. It was the 14th day they came out of Egypt. Woo! How many of y'all got one of them Bibles with the red letters? The words of Christ in red. I've never had one, but I'll... I'll if you want to buy me that for my birthday, Brandon, you could, I'll be re- all month is my birthday. Words of Christ in red. The only words of Christ in red in all the church epistles, I think, I hadn't found no other, was when Jesus said to Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, this thorn's about to kill me. Anybody living with a thorn that he gave you? My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made, thy strength is made perfect in weakness. Fourteen words. <laughs> and in the same chapter, he said it was 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. And you turn 2 Corinthians 12 to Galatians 1. It's usually just one page. And he says, Paul went and met with Peter about 14 days. Mm. 14 is the number of mass deliverance. It's the number of deliverance. But it's more specific than just general deliverance. Anytime you see number 14, God is bringing His people over to another place. (laughs) Run that through the Bible all you want to. Look up 14 all day long. Every time you find 14, it's in the context of He's bringing His people out and over to somewhere else. So I had, sorry about all that, but I had to just tell you, when I run into number 14, Enoch pops up and says, the Lord's coming. (laughs) Behold, he cometh. Well, on and on it goes. On and on it goes. Verse 16, you got murmurs and complainers. Oh, look at the end of verse 16. There's social media having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. <laughs> and then verse 18 is charismatics. There will be mockers in the last time. Separated themselves, but they're sensual, not having the spirit. Mimickers. Well, we could keep going here, but I just wanted to show you something this morning. I didn't mean to get off into the the conditions that we're looking at. But I needed to show you some of that to give you the context of all the promises that he gave to us. Look what he gave us in that same little book right before we wait off into all of... I'm not... Forgive my figure of speech for a moment. Wading off into all of that hell that's in the book of Jude. Look what he gave us. He gave us Jude, Jesus... And James, <laughs> ain't you glad there's some apostles and there's some pastors and there's, ain't you glad the Lord Jesus, ain't you glad we got these? If you young men knew this or not, Jude and James was the little brothers of Jesus. <laughs> they were the half-brothers. Yet neither one of them would claim that. They, they could have used that as a claim to fame. Could you imagine... Now this James, he was a pastor in Jerusalem along with Peter. Great pastor in Jerusalem, the first church. And Jude. And yet they never would say that they were the brother of Jesus. They held him in too high regard. And by the way, they could have used that for their own advantage, but they wasn't about their self. 
What do you think about people who don't look for an advantage to promote their self, but they look for every opportunity just to honor the Lord Jesus? You know what he said? He said, James is my brother. <laughs> but he didn't mention it, me and James. <laughs> Woo! Could you imagine growing up in a house and Jesus is your big brother? You couldn't make him mad? I bet they tried. <laughs> could you imagine that? I wonder what kind of stories they could have told. By the way, for all Roman Catholics, Mary's no longer a virgin. They have her as a perpetual virgin. Her and, her and Joseph had several kids, boys and girls. We're not supposed to worship our mother, We're not supposed to worship Mary. Jude and James. Mm. Look what else he gave us. We're sanctified. We're preserved. We're called. Well, somebody ought to pick up a pew and sling it all the way to Walker County. With all of that, and I'm not being vulgar when I use this language, when all of that actual hell that we've got to face, God gave us a little promise that as you're walking off into the book of Jude, good news for you, God the Father's already sanctified you. It happened when you got saved. Set apart and made holy. That's why we're not in that other bunch. We're set apart and made holy. Glad I'm saved. And then preserved. Jesus preserved me. Preserved. Kept. What about that keeping business? Mm, go down to verse 24. I'm 50 years old now. I've got to pull my glasses down. I didn't have to do it Thursday, but I'm doing it now. Look in verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Well, somebody ought to shout. You say, well, can I do anything I want to? Back up to verse 21. I always thought this was interesting. One's practical, one's positional. Keep yourselves. Keep yourselves. And then two verses later, he's the one keeping us. <laughs> keep yourselves. What are you saying? The love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do I do that? Go to church Sunday morning instead of sleeping in on Sunday morning. Hey. Go to revival instead of going to the concert. Hey. Go to work day instead of going off to the lake with a hey. bunch of drinking, hey. a bunch of drinking naked hey. people. Hey. Talk to you can keep yourself in the love of God. Hey. Read your Bible. Put your face in the book more than in the Facebook. Hey. Did I say that right? I didn't get that confused. Did I? You can keep yourselves. And yet he's a keeping us. Sanctified, preserved, and I love that, called. Thank God I've been called. I have a great calling, a high calling. I'm not talking about preaching. I'm talking about salvation. Most time you read in the New Testament about the call, you see your calling, brethren. Had not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble, but things which are base, things which are despised, yea, things which are not, hath God called. He's called us into his family. Well, I'm nearly done. I'm almost at the end. I'll know when I get there. Sanctified, preserved, called. But I love this next one. Well, I skipped the Trinity. There's the Father. There's Jesus Christ. There's the Holy Ghost, so he's not mentioned. You can see his work. That's how he does. He don't want to be talked about. He just wants to do what he does for the glory of Christ. But I love this. Mercy, peace, and love. If I'm not mistaken, y'all go look this up. My uncle, Brother Johnny, back there, he likes to study. You can look this up. I think it, all the other places is grace, mercy, and peace. All, all through Paul's epistles, anytime you say that little, I don't know if that's a salutation or a blessing, Brother Craig, Brother Zach, it's always grace, mercy, and peace. I don't believe this little trilogy is anywhere else. Mercy, peace, and love. Whew. We're going to need mercy in this hour. He's going to have to help us when we don't deserve it. 
We're going to need peace. Did you see all that stuff we had to talk about a while ago? We're living in the middle of all that. He's the only one who can give us peace, peace, wonderful peace. Coming down from the Father above, so weeps over my soul. In silence of something, in fathomless billows of love. Peace, peace. Ain't you glad walking in the middle of all of them devils and darkness and depravities and depression? You can have peace and love. The love of God, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. To know the love of God which shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto you. Isn't that amazing that he knew what we would need in this hour? Mercy. Peace. And that unconditional love. Where's grace? Where's grace then? Where's grace? It's interesting and I'm done now. But grace is a doctrinal matter. Now, right before the second coming, look in verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, here it is, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. In this hour, grace is under attack. Turning you better, you, listen, they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. I'm going to say something one time. If y'all act right, I only got to say it one time. That means if you say amen enough to make me happy. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Anybody who takes the grace of God and then their twist on it is, now I can do anything I want to because Christ has grace. You better run the other way. You were warned about that right at the end of the church age. Turning the grace of our God into I can live any sensual way I want to. Grace don't mean you can live in sin. Grace means, thank God, you can have a life where you don't live in sin. Turning that grace. I got a beautiful little sermon, Brother Quarles, on putting a twist on grace. About seven different ways that different denominations, different doctrines, and different philosophies put a twist on grace. Grace is under attack in this hour. The doctrine of it, the duty of it. But I tell you what he's given us. Mercy. That means we don't deserve it. Peace and love. Well, y'all pray for me tomorrow night. Lord willing, I'm going to preach on them three. Cain. Balaam and Korah. But I had this on my heart and I appreciate us being able to look at the book of Jude together. Can we stand? I'm going to pray and I'm going to turn it over to the pastor. I, whatever the pastor wants to do. Our Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the cross of Calvary. Thank you for the little book of Jude that'll get us right on through the end of the church age until we can stand in Revelation 1 at the second coming. Father, speak to us and help us. Watch over us and breathe upon us. In Christ's name we pray.